And Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light for your life, part 22. The Just Jesus Evangelistic Campaign, day 122. Yesterday I mentioned that this was verse 1. It's not verse 12. Please look at John 8, verse 12. Believe it or not, this is a part of a long conversation between Jesus Christ and the religious leaders, the religious establishment, from verse 1 almost to down to verse 59. And that's why I'm preaching it this way. And the most profound statement, all of it, all, everything that Jesus said was profound. Uh, but the statement that stood out the most at the beginning was when Jesus Christ said these words. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. That is a profound statement. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And it is a beautiful thing if you have never experienced it. Uh, it is a beautiful thing to not have to walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Amen, somebody. And that is why I titled this message, Jesus is the light for your life. He is the light of the world and the light for your life. Uh, turn down to uh, verse 56. As we have dealt with every verse in this passage, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. I've dealt with this two nights in a row. A very shocking statement to the religious establishment. And he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. That just took the cake right there for these Jewish leaders, the re religious establishment. They just couldn't take it anymore. That was like slapping them in the face real hard. For the Bible says in verse 59, Then took they up stones, to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself. Some say he did it naturally, some say he did it supernaturally, and went out of the temple going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And when I read that verse, I think about the movie, uh, the, the movie rather, Catch Me If You Can. Holy Father God, we praise you and we thank you for leaving us your powerful, exciting, and blessed and anointed Holy Word. Lord, you told us as your preachers to engage in the foolishness of preaching. Lord, to most people in the world, what I am doing right now is absolute foolishness. But, Lord, uh, to you it is not. And uh, you have convinced me that it is not. Uh, because through the foolishness of preaching, souls are being saved from an eternal hell and uh, gaining a home in heaven forever. And we praise you and we thank you for uh, the power of preaching your holy word. There is nothing like it on earth, and we give you the glory, praise, and honor, knowing that as your holy word goes out today, 
It is a seed that is sown into some heart. Even if one soul gets saved today, it'll be worth it all. If one soul just gets the gospel seed in their heart, it's worth it all. Uh, if, uh, and then we know that according to your word and your will, you will have somebody to come by and water it. And then you will get, you will give the increase and souls will be saved, lives will be changed, and you will gain all of the glory, praise, and honor. And that's how it should be. We thank you so much for this privilege and opportunity. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, Billy Sunday, the great evangelist, uh, who marched across America and preached the gospel in a white tabernacle that he would have constructed everywhere he went. Uh, years before Billy Graham came on the scene, it was Billy Sunday who used to play f uh, baseball and who got saved and Jesus changed his life, and uh, he went barnstorming across the nation preaching the gospel and trying to uh, encourage people to position themselves to be revived. He said, there are 256 names given in the Bible for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I suppose this was because he was infinitely beyond all that any one name could express. I like that real good. Ladies and gentlemen, the Jews obviously don't like the fact that Jesus claimed Abraham would be on his side in the debate over death and eternal life. However, they zero in on the claim that Jesus is making by implication that he is old enough to have communicated with Abraham. And they did not realize that he created Abraham. He called Abraham. They reply incredulously, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? they still thinking in the flesh. It's hard to deal with the religious folk who are still thinking in the flesh. Uh, you're wasting your time. The Bible even tells you you're wasting your time trying to argue with people who are religious over questions and genealogies and so forth. Uh, Jesus knew this firsthand. This goes back to their accusation that Jesus is trying to make something of himself by claiming God-like attributes. Some of them thought he was crazy. Here, seeing that Abraham has been dead for hundreds of years, they know that Jesus is claiming to be everlasting. Jesus confirms their suspicions when he says, Verily, verily, truly, truly, after this long, patient com conversation that Jesus was having with these uh, people who hated him, these religious leaders, the religious establishment, he says, Verily, verily, truly, truly, hear me well, hear me well, I'm getting ready to shock and amaze you. He said, I say unto you, before Abraham was, my, 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 before Abraham was, before Abraham even existed, before Abraham was, I am. They knew in the words of uh, Oliver B. Green, the great evangelist of many years ago, he used to love to use that word instantaneously. They knew instantaneously 
what Jesus was talking about. In other words, before Abraham began to even exist, before he was even born, I was existing throughout eternity, past. If any of the Jewish religious leaders had doubts before, they have none now. Jesus just said to them, to their face, after this long conversation, this patient conversation with uh, these rebellious religious leaders, the religious establishment, he laid hint after hint after hint. So he tells them plainly, I am. Same words that God said to Moses. William Barclay, the great theologian of years gone by, said these words. All of the lightning flashes regarding this passage. He said the small glimpses that Jesus revealed of his true nature before now pale in comparison before the blaze of this verse. There was nothing else Jesus could have said that would have shocked and amazed and enraged the religious establishment. In other words, Jesus has done it now. Jesus uses the phrase, I am. I am God. The same term God used to speak to Moses when he was revealing himself to Moses at the burning bush. When he asked, Lord, when the people ask who sent me, what do I tell them? God said, tell them, I am sent you. Now that sounds like God. That sounds like God. Only God would say something like that. I am. That's it. You don't need to hear my other names. Just tell them I am sent you. And here Jesus is saying, I am is standing before you. What does I am mean? I am means, beloved, eternally existent. God had no birth and will have no death, contrary to what humanists and secularists say today, talking foolishly that God is dead. God is not dead. He's alive and well. I spoke with him this morning. Amen, somebody. God always has been and always will be. I am. God needs no one and nothing to benefit his existence. Amen, somebody. He is entirely self-sufficient. God is not bound by time or space. He is infinite and everlasting beyond your imagination. He is infinite and everlasting. By calling himself I am, Jesus was claiming all these attributes for himself, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us and with you is standing in front of you. Amen, somebody. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, this, this took them back. Uh, they bounced back. They went back on that and, 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 and instantaneously were grabbing for rocks. The Jews who did not believe that Jesus was God or anything close to God viewed this as blasphemy. This showed that on some level they took Jesus seriously. Interestingly, 
He was not just a madman or a rabble rouser, as some thought. He was making serious, logical claims that they would not allow, that they would not accept. This is their reaction. The Bible says, then took they up stones. Can you imagine? They started trying to find some stones in the temple to cast at him. However, Jesus, however, since Jesus' time had not yet come, the Bible tells us that the Lord hid himself. And went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. You say, preacher, did he make himself invisible like Superman or something? Whatever he did, he got out of there. And they could not stone him. Because it was not his time. And when you're God, you can, you can do pretty much whatever you want to do. You can do whatever you want to do. Anyhow, anyway, amen. I personally, he just walked out. And, and, and maybe blinded their eyes. I don't know. Notice the contrast, beloved, in this chapter. John chapter 8. It began with the Jewish religious leaders, the religious establishment wanting to stone a woman they said was caught in adultery. Jesus handled that situation. He wrote all of the names on the ground and all of the sins they were committing, I believe. I, we're not sure about that. After a long discussion with Jesus, <clears throat> it ends with them now picking up stones and trying to stone Jesus. Jesus who set the woman free. This is a very vivid image of what Jesus did for us. He prevented the stones from falling on the woman or being thrown at the woman who deserved to die for her sins. But eventually, Jesus would receive that punishment and death in his own body on the cross for her sins, for your sins, and for mine. Amen, somebody. Amen. Yes, Emmanuel, God with us. Yes, the great I am, the eternally existent one. I'm here to tell you, beloved, I'm here to tell you he's a bad somebody in a good sense. The eternal existing one who needs neither man nor material things, he needs nothing, would submit to death at the hands of these envious and jealous, wicked and evil religious leaders. The religious establishment The pastor of the First Baptist Church, the pastor at St. So-and-so Methodist Church, the Pentecostal Church religious establishment, they were the main ones who killed Jesus, not the Romans. The religious establishment picking up stones in the temple. Surely you are not to kill anybody if you are part of the religious establishment. And certainly you are not to kill the Son of God in the temple. My soul. Accusing Jesus of being demon possessed. When in fact you're demon possessed in the house of God, you lying hypocrite. Jesus submitted to death 
at the hands of these wicked sinners in order that those sinners might be saved and might receive eternal life. Uh, those sinners, we're talking about you and me. The woman at the well. And the woman taken in adultery. How about it, dear friend? Have you committed any sins? Have you ever told any lies? You go to hell for that. Have you lusted after a woman in your heart? You said in your heart, I wish I could have that. You lusted after another man's wife. You say, well, I wish I could have her just for a little while. You lusted after a woman's husband. You committed fornication. You are an adulterer and an adulteress. You are engaged in homosexuality, lesbianism. You're a thief on Wall Street. You're a black racist and you're a white racist. You're a brown racist. You're a robber of widows and little children. You're a rapist. Have you ever sinned before, dear sinner friend? Today is your day of salvation. We're all in the same boat. I'm just a beggar telling other beggars where the bread is. I'm no different than you. I'm not a part of the religious establishment. I'm a sinner like you. I need Jesus. How about you? Dear friend, accept the fact that you are a sinner. And that you need Jesus to save you. The Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou you shalt be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, that is in hell, but have everlasting life in heaven. Yes, this is a life and death situation. I'm not playing with you, I'm not up here for my health. I'm just like you. I'd rather be uh, lying down watching the basketball game, humanly speaking. But Jesus told me to preach the gospel to you. And you are here for a reason. You are here because of a, a divine appointment. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ right now. Believe that he died on the cross for your sins. He came to die for your sins. Don't pass on this opportunity. He shed his blood on the cross for your sins as the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. You know what that means. He died, was buried, and rose again. Just believe in him. Pray and ask him to save your soul. For the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that if thou, that if you, shalt believe, shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou, you, shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's good news for you, dear friend. You don't have to join a church to be saved. You ought to join a church after you get saved. You don't have to get baptized to get saved. You ought to get baptized after you get saved. But these things will not save you. Changing your behavior and doing good works will not save you. You ought to do works and change your behavior after you get saved. But that will not save you. <laughs> the only thing that will save you is your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Shaking my hand will not save you. Joining, uh, sitting in the chair will not save you. By the way, the doors of the church are always open. 
I got saved in a dorm room while I was in the military. I was not in church. I got saved in spite of the church. I got saved outside of the church and from the club. I was in both of them, like some of you. Christ saved me. The church did not save me. Christ saved me. Good works did not save me. Christ saved me. Uh, singing in the choir did not save me. Doing good works did not save me. Christ saved me. And Christ will save you. For if Jesus can save me, he can save you. How about it, dear friend? Are you willing right now to believe in your heart? In the Lord Jesus Christ and pray and ask him to save your soul. Pray with me right now. The same prayer I prayed 36 years ago. It's called the sinner's prayer. And I'm just going to help you because you've never prayed it before. That's all. If you don't want me to pray with you, that's fine. Pray it yourself. Just tell the Lord that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. Because I now believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, your son. And he'll save you instantaneously. Instantaneously he'll save you. I've shared this before and I'll say it again. I believe God is sitting on the edge of his throne. Just, just waiting for you to look to him. Just give him a look and he'll save you. And one of the reasons is because he knows what awaits you if you don't trust him as savior. Eternal hell fire. Oh, now, preacher, you're trying to scare me. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you the truth. So pray with me right now, phrase by phrase. Holy Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. Lord, I have broken uh, your Ten Commandments at some point. And I understand that if I break just one commandment, and I've broken many, uh, Lord, I would go to hell without Jesus. For Jesus Christ's sake, then, Lord, please forgive me of my sins. As I now believe with all of my heart that Jesus Christ died for me, was buried, and rose again. Lord Jesus, I'm speaking directly to you now. Please come into my heart and save my wretched soul. Have mercy upon me, a sinner. Fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. And help me to repent of my old life and my sins. And help me to follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus Christ's name I pray and for his sake. Amen. Dear friend, if you believed in your heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again, and you believe in Jesus today, allow me to say congratulations on trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior and praying that prayer. For in doing so, you've done the most important thing in life, and that is trusting Jesus Christ as Savior. I assure you that you will never regret it. For more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, go to gospellightsociety.com and read what to do after you enter through the door. Jesus Christ said in John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture.